Professor David Lowe is a man of many parts. He is the inaugural director of Deakin University's Alfred Deakin Research Institute. And as head of ADRI, he's also linked to the Alfred Deakin Prime Ministerial Library. It's one of just a few of its type here in Australia. Well, one of the great things about the creation of the Alfred Deakin Research Institute is that it's also closely connected with the Prime Ministerial Library, which bears witness to the legacy of this wonderful man who is the outstanding figure, I think, in the early years and the creation of the Commonwealth of Australia. We're, we're lucky to have such a, a setup because, well, firstly, there aren't many of them in Australia. Um, there are libraries and institutes around the names of um, John Curtin, Bob Hawke and Gough Whitlam, but we, we're really the fourth. We add to that. All the other ones operate in a slightly independent way. There's no great sense of a network yet, although I'm hopeful that might kick in. But more generally, um, Alfred is surely deserving of this. Alfred's love of books and the way in which ideas influenced his, his thinking, his belief that politics um, should constantly be injected with new ideas, new thinking, um, the capacity to inject into policy influences from travels overseas, from books he'd read, a wide range of reading in both um, English and non-English languages, if anyone warrants the Prime Ministerial Library and the connection of the value of scholarship towards thinking and politics and policy, it's surely Alfred Deakin. So we're very fortunate to have a collection which includes um, a lot of the, his own personal books. Um, for example, a series of French books that he read on one of his trips to London. You know, he just took a, a trunk of books with him, rather, which had um, him brushing up on his French during that voyage, but also a number of other prayer books, diaries and so on. Some of the um, works of Alfred himself, some of the things that he penned, um, are jointly held between us and the National Library of Australia. Some of it's been digitised, but not all of it. And that's where this collection remains so valuable. Generally, too, we're incredibly happy to bounce off the legacy of the man because his achievements were just so formidable and so impressive. One of the things I'd love to see, actually, looking, looking forward, is perhaps an even more robust role for things like prime ministerial libraries in Australian life. Because if you look at the US scene, for example, these mega presidential libraries, which house entire research programs, um, provide scholarships to visiting scholars, um, they, they're gravitationally pulling in the um, lives and achievements of others who worked around certain presidents. So they become a, a kind of gravitational spot for researchers to go to. It would be great to see a similar development um, perhaps occur in Australian life. And whilst we're not there yet, it may be that we're starting something with the Alfred Deakin Prime Ministerial Library. And, you know, Alfred certainly um, warrants that kind of attention for just how significant his achievements were. He was not only the second Prime Minister of Australia and Prime Minister three times in the first decade, but the legacy of his, of the, the things that he left behind are still talked about, as some people talk about the Australian, so-called Australian settlement, the foundational, the architecture of um, bureaucracy, of um, political structures, which saw Australia through much of the 20th century. We're talking about things such as the arbitration system, um, old age pensions, the idea of um, national service leading to an, a distinctive Australian armed force, the creation of the Australian Navy, the laying of plans for a transcontinental railway, the Bureau of Meteorology, the High Court and the, the legal system. All of these bear the hand of Alfred at work. Um, so his, achie his achievements in just laying foundation stones for what happened in Australia as Australia moved beyond this fledging Commonwealth, this new thing, into growing as a, as a unified country during the 20th century can't be underestimated. I think Alfred will also be thrilled to know that there's been a research institute named after him and indeed a, a university too. Um, he, even in talking to his daughters, for example, always encouraged them to think broadly. Um, he was encouraging his daughters to read non-Christian scripture and non-Christian writings too, whilst of course a Christian man himself. Um, his travels, which took him to places such as the United States and India, before that kind of um, f gravitating um, move towards England, which so many of his colleagues did as their first journey overseas. Alfred's inclination to see the region as a source of inspiration, ideas uh, and a necessity for Australians to know, just showed that, that kind of hunger for information, that's, that restless spirit, that restless mind, which 
is so well captured in the enterprises of a university. So again, I can't think of many other figures after whom a university should better be named. Alfred's journeyings to India um, are of perhaps special significance um, for, for his age and for, the, for that time. He was interested in India in multiple ways. One was in irrigation. Um, Alfred drew inspiration from what he saw when he visited India um, at the end of the 1880s, early 1890s, and also in California and brought those ideas back and tried to implement them in the state of Victoria here. But it went beyond irrigation too. He was interested in the spirituality he saw at work in India, and he was interested in trying to imagine a future of Australian-Indian relations. In fact, he, his prediction was that Australia and India should logically develop a relationship that was multifaceted, have all sorts of strands of connections. Now, he was a bit imprecise as to how that would pan out. You can forgive him for that. But he did see, by virtue of geography, by virtue of um, vigorous societies with keen approaches to spirituality, um, to thinking about futures of politics, to managing resources and so on, he did see lots of connections that should fall into place as both countries grew. And again, there are very few of that time who came out with that kind of statement. There are very few who travelled to India and commented on it as opposed to the European mode of thinking where most Australian minds gravitated to in, say, the late 19th century. The other thing about Alfred, which always strikes me, is how unfinished a business he thought the Act of Federation was. He was essentially, I think, an optimist. He saw that the Australian Federation was an ongoing process which needed to be constantly reinvigorated and reinvented. And that's where someone like himself, a politician who would constantly bring new ideas in, borrowed from overseas, grabbed from here and there, was the ideal person to set this in motion. So he was an optimist about who would come after him. Um, even though Alfred couldn't predict things like um, more recent day innovations such as native title legislation, such was the thinking of the man that I can well believe that he imagined at some stage uh, a more constant um, degree of policy innovation in relation to Australia's indigenous population would be factored in to the, the legal system. He did imagine that the High Court should be constantly um, revisiting just how well the Constitution was working for Australia. And it's this, uh, this dialectical approach, if you like, and this, this kind of assumption of constant reform and progress, which these days you might say slightly old-fashioned nation building, but boy, it was impressive, and geez, did it lay the foundations for what's been a pretty good experiment ever since. Mm -hmm.